um, this was 12th webinar in QCAM series, um, how to use QCAM, and um, where we invite uh, QCAM developers and users to speak about using QCAM in their research. And we apologize for this delay, and uh, we had some technical difficulties related to broadcasting this webinar, but um, we hope to carry on successfully. And our, our speaker today is uh, Professor Martin Head Gordon, um, one of the co-founders of QCAM, um, and uh, one of the main authors of QCAM. And you've, if you've ever run QCAM, you must have run code written by Martin Head Gordon. And um, today, Martin is going to talk about using QCAM um, 4.1 and its features. Please welcome Martin Head Gordon. Okay, thank you, uh, Genia. And I, I guess I add my apologies for the uh, technical difficulties here. So, um, um, so you are actually not seeing the proper slideshow, but in fact just seeing the um, um, uh, seeing the uh, the um, the view within the keynote. Um, so, um, um, uh, so anyway, um, we'll get going here, and um, um, and. Uh, um, the title of the talk is "What's New in Qcam 4.1," and um, and what we'll cover um, uh, over the next, I guess, 50 minutes or so is a, um, a firstly a brief introduction both to Qcam and um, to me. Um, then, secondly, um, I'll try and give you a walk through um, Qcam's um, features, in particular, what's new in Qcam 4.1, and since um, Qcam is a code of between three and four million lines these days. Um, this has to be a very quick look at very many things with uh, a terrible absence of detail as a result. And then to partially compensate, the third part of the talk will then be a, um, a more careful in-depth look at a few of the um, features that are, um, um, that are important for users of QCAM and uh, distinctive. And then finally, a little bit about the future. Um, Okay, so, um, well, as for me, um, there I am. I'm originally Australian. Um, I've been in the US for, um, uh, for going on three decades, and um, I, uh, I actually um, started quantum chemistry um, originally because um, I got hooked on computers as a hobby when it was too late to become a computer scientist and discovered that one could, in fact, um, a little bit have the best of both worlds, um, combine chemistry and computers, and um, and these days I'm a professor at UC Berkeley, and I have a group of about 23 amazing students and postdocs who um, keep me very, very busy. Um, and um, and a big part of our work, it's probably something like um, um, you know, 80 to 80 percent of the theory work in my group is connected to developments within QCAM. But we are in fact only one of um, probably now um, around 40 or 50 distinct development sites with around um, around 200 active developers. And so this is a, a partial list. And to um, QCAM's headquarters itself recently moved to California, um, now in Pleasanton. Um, and, um, um, and, uh, and that's where a lot of the developments that I'll be telling you about today have been done. But we are fortunate to have this extraordinarily strong developer network. and um, I have no time really to go through the, um, the list here, but I might just highlight um, one or two people. Um, firstly, Peter Gill. Um, he is the, um, uh, one of the very original co-founders of QCAM and, um, and wrote um, the most important pieces of its integral package and today is the president of QCAM and chairman of the board, I guess. Um, then John Herbert at Ohio State is another QCAM board member who has contributed um, very important features to do with non-bonded interactions and salvation. Anna Krilov at the University of Southern California is another QCAM board member and is the lead developer of the coupled cluster features of QCAM. And, um, um, and, uh, and so those are just a few of the highlights. But as you can see, many of America's best and the world's best universities are represented on this on this list. Um, to zoom into the Pleasanton piece of QCAM, um, I want to highlight briefly QCAM's employees. Um, it was um, Evgeny Ipanovsky who introduced me a few minutes ago, and he's 
QCAM's um, most recent hire as a programmer, and um, he specializes in, in the development and support of the coupled cluster parts of QCAM. Um, then Zheng Ting Gan um, is, um, is currently the um, driving force behind QCAM's um, parallel um, DFT code and also the, um, uh, the uh, density functional exchange correlation features and many other things besides. And Yihan Shao is our third programmer, and Yihan is responsible for a truly amazing range of features that I, I do not have time to go into. But he, um, um, but the reason that's so amazing is because he's in charge of relations between QCAM, the company, and its academic developers, and so he has very broad collaborations amongst them. Um, Hilary Popel keeps our books straight, and she is um, John Popel's daughter, so we have a historic connection back to John Popel, who. Um, was my thesis advisor back in the Paleolithic era. Um, and finally, um, Mary Sue Noble is um, our office manager and, um, and, um, and is the driving force behind most of QCAM's marketing efforts. Um, so that, that's our team. And, um, um, and then maybe just a little bit of the history of the code. Um, we, um, we are about 20 years old as a code, celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. These days, um, in academic circles, it's fashionable to talk about the sustainability of software, and so we're proud to have sus sustained ourselves for two decades. Um, but of course, when you start off with no code um, in 1993 to write a, a new piece of software, um, it takes a while to make it actually useful. And um, while QCAM's corporate motto around the mid-90s was calculations that used to be impossible in our routine, the inside joke is, um, is, is a little different and is shown uh, there with, in 1997 when we released version 1. But by the time we released version 2 in 2000, we, we were becoming a serious code with 36 contributors, um, robust, reasonably robust, quite full-featured, and QCAM became the back end to the widely used Spartan modeling code. And, um, and you can read about QCAM 2.0 in that paper published in 2000. And time marches on, and we released version 3 in 2006 with an interface to Charm and um, published a, a paper describing its main features. And version 4, um, the first part of this came out in 2012, and uh, as I've already mentioned, is over 3 million lines of code and, a, uh, um, and really a, a state of the art in many ways. So, um, so it's my job today to kind of walk you through a few aspects of, uh, of what makes it state of the art, and um, um, we'll, we'll just kind of go from there. So now, um, so now we enter a quick look at, um, at the features of QCAM, and, um, and, we'll, uh, and, we'll, um, and we'll begin by, um, um, by taking a look at some of the reasons that you should consider using it if you're not already, and if you are already using it, we'll then zero in on some of the things that are brand new um, after this. So um, QCAM was originally um, built on the idea that we wanted to do things as efficiently as possible. So the number one reason that anybody should consider QCAM is its very high efficiency um, in the fundamental kernels of quantum chemistry, namely the two electron integrals that control the, um, the cost, the overall cost of density functional theory calculations and the exchange correlation quadrature that is associated with numerical integration and the various corresponding pieces that contribute to the overall efficiency of electron correlation methods. And very important these days is OpenMP for parallel capabilities. Um, turning to the ground state of molecules, which is what people do most of the time in applied quantum chemistry, um, QCAM has a truly vast array of state-of-the-art features for treating um, molecules by density functional theory. So the range of density functionals is absolutely encyclopedic and includes new functionals are being added all the time. And so version 4.1, as you'll see in a little bit, does include the range of new functionals. Um, then um, we have distinct um, uh, um, distinctive features for wa in wave function methods. Um, fast RIMP2 gradients are one of our long-time selling points. Our coupled cluster code is being constantly updated and is state-of-the-art. I'll show you some timings on that later. And then we have a range of unique methods um, 
that involve acronyms you may not have heard of, and I don't really have time to talk about them today. They are aimed at trying to um, accomplish the sorts of things people do with CASA CF these days at much lower cost. One thing I will touch on later is energy decomposition analysis because version 4.1 upgrades this capability. Um, then uh, reasons number five, six, and seven to consider using QCAM are associated with excited states. Um, we are one of the only codes that includes the analytical TDDFT Hessian in addition to analytical gradients. We have quite unique spin flip TDDFT methods um, and, um, and a very much state of the art couple cluster package for doing excited states as well as some simplified methods. That's the um, SOS SISD um, type family there. Then there's a range of, um, of um, non-standard but very useful tools one can use to probe electron transfer or energy transfer um, um, in, in a range of ways that include constrained density functional theory. Um, of course, all of this so far is about an energy, but walking on potential energy surfaces is a critical piece of quantum chemistry, and, um, and QCAM offers a variety of state-of-the-art and unique capabilities in, uh, in, um, in that context also. Um, if the first approximations of quantum chemistry are how do you treat correlation and what's your basis set, the, um, the third approximation is typically what do you do about the environment? And in that context, QCAM has um, very good continuum solvation capabilities that, um, that avoid some of the potential energy surface discontinuities that traditional PCM methods suffer from. And we have a, um, a collection of several different QMMM approaches, including both conventional um, link atom approaches, um, onion approaches, um, effective fragment potential methods, um, and, uh, and others. And finally, um, um, while one can always um, use text input, most people opt to use either IQMOL, our GUI, which is uh, freely available, or, um, um, or, the, um, or the very, very refined Spartan interface that's available through WaveFunction, and that's their website if you've, if you've not looked at it before. All right, so um, so um, so th there's a familiar um, emblem to many of us in the QCAM development community because most of us are banned by Gaussian, um, and uh, and so that's the common meaning of that symbol. Um, but to us as QCAM developers, it means something else as well. It also means that a lot of what we do, since we're banned by Gaussian, is actually not in Gaussian, and um, and so the, um, and so unique features that are only available in QCAM is really one of the themes that, um, that we like to stress. So with that in mind, um, let's now begin trying to walk through the um, um, kind of a, a catalog of the things that are new in QCAM 4.1. And this really starts with improvements to the fundamental algorithms. And so um, greatly improved OpenMP capabilities is really key to effectively using modern com mid-range computing, the kind of computer resources that are typical um, academic group or national lab group or industrial group can readily afford if they can afford anything. And so we've put a lot of effort into this and you'll hear about that soon. And another fundamental area of algorithms that has substantially improved is effective core potentials, which are of course very important for modeling heavy elements. And in the past, QCAM has had limitations for the evaluation of um, analytical gradients and analytical hesh and, and hessians um, with effective core potentials. And we have, um, thanks to Yihan Shao's work, um, substantially eliminated those. Um, there are improved SCF capabilities. You'll hear about, um, about the unrestricted ALMO in a few minutes. Um, there are numerous enhancements to the couple cluster code um, led by Anna's group with important contributions from Genia. I'll tell you a bit about a neat little thing called attenuated MP2 that was developed in my group. And then as, as I already mentioned, um, we have these very interesting algorithms for strong correlation, but because that's kind of a specialized application area, I won't touch on it today. Um, um, okay, so, um, um, so then in terms of um, potential surface walking methods, um, there are two new things in QCAM 4.1. The first is an upgrade to our freezing string method, which if you don't know about it, you'll learn a bit later, a, a little bit about it further on in the talk. Um, it can now be done 
um, as a way to initiate searches for transition structures with minimal human effort and no um, Hessians required. So this is very useful for large molecules. Um, and then um, we also have potential energy surface scan capabilities that are new. Um, a whole bunch of things for intermolecular interactions. There is some um, RI-based SAP0 code from John Herbert's group at Ohio State, and also from John Herbert's group um, are the even more efficient XBAL and XSAP methods that allow the efficient treatment of systems with many, many fragments at a, um, at a, at a cost that really sits in between electronic structure theory and molecular mechanics. But because I'm not expert on that, I'm not going to be talking about it today. And then finally, I would mention um, extensions of effective fragment potentials to macromolecules from Anna Krilov's group and a lot of other effective fragment potential work from Ludmila Slipchenko's group. And in addition to that, there's everything else that was new in QCHEM 4 last year. Um, so lots and lots of stuff there. Um, um, but that's kind of then a, a sort of an overview. And, um, and, um, and now what I want to do in this um, main section of the talk is dig a bit deeper into uh, three or four of these topics. And, um, and we'll be starting with um, OpenMP parallel capabilities because, um, because this really has a big impact on everyone who uses QCAM and so it really should be the first topic to be discussed. And, um, um, and, and maybe just, just as a, a little bit of background, QCAM has had parallel capabilities for the past decade or so, they have been built on MPI, which is a distributed parallel paradigm. And that means when you run the MPI parallel code on a shared memory machine, you are, you are forced to replicate memory and it becomes very inefficient. By contrast, OpenMP is a shared memory parallel approach, um, is very resource efficient and, um, and ideally suited in my view and I think the view of many of us at QCAM to mid-range computing. So what I should say at the outset is that what I view and I think what most of my colleagues at QCAM view as the target system here is to make the best possible use of one node for one job because a typical small research group will have a number of nodes that can be dedicated to a person um, for research, but typically that person will want to run multiple jobs. So it makes great sense to try to use one node optimally. And that's really the um, design theme behind our OpenMP capabilities. And so they come in three different variants, which I will walk through with you over the next several slides. The first is at the self-consistent field level for density functional theory and for hartree fock theory. And this is Zheng Ting Gan's work. Um, the second is for MP2 energies and radiants. That's Matt Goldie's work. He's in my group at Berkeley. And the third is for Kepler-Pasta theory, and that's Evgeny, primarily Evgeny Ekonofsky's work. And, uh, um, and so maybe let's get started with a uh, uh, with what I guess is a, uh, is a is a little vitamin supplement, glutamine. Um, and uh, Zheng Ting sent me this uh, this data early this morning, so it's very freshly um, installed here. Um, and this is just showing you what happens on a typical Intel-based node for a typical medium-sized density functional theory calculation. So the curve in white is the time in seconds um, about, um, versus the number of CPUs as we walk across here. And you can see that jumping from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 12 CPUs is very rapidly diminishing the cost such, a, such that we are more than 10 times faster at 12 CPUs. And one is then using the full resources of the node for one job. This is a 12 node CPU, in fact. Um, the bars are the corresponding speed ups. So, um, so if, you, um, if you look carefully at this, you'll see that um, the speed up for two CPUs um, is, in fact, um, theoretically impossible. It's greater than two. Um, so the point is that um, Zheng Ting did such a great job of, um, of reworking our integral code to be OpenMP parallel that in fact, um, that in fact what you see here um, are improvements to the scalar code. So what I'm showing you for one CPU is our old um, version 4.0 um, scalar code. And for two CPUs, you're then looking at um, a factor of, of over two and a half, almost two and a half speed up because we've um, retuned the algorithms as well as added parallel capabilities. 
um, it, do, it then does scale very respectably, as you can see by looking at the jump from 2 to 4, or 4 to 8, um, nearly, nearly directly linear speed ups, and by the time you're at 12, we have a net speed up of about a factor of 10. Very, very nice for practical applications. So people in my group who've been using this code over the past several months say that you know, they can now do in hours calculations that used to take weeks when they perhaps first joined my group several years ago. So this is really a very, very useful capability. Um, just to give you some idea about slightly bigger systems, here are a couple of um, calculations um, involving um, um, not just SCF, but also MP2 um, on slightly bigger systems than glutamine. This is a, well, I guess it's a GCGC um, um, stack on the left, and PHE, which I'm not going to be able to recall what exactly that is on the right, but the important point is these are calculations in the regime of 1 to 2,000 basis functions, and running on the kind of node that you can buy for about $6,000, and I know this because my group has bought a bunch of them, is, um, it's a 64-core, 2.3 gigahertz AMD Opteron, so we switched from Intel Xeon nodes on the previous slide to AMD Opteron nodes on this one, but you can get those for about $6,000, and the basic point is that um, a 1,000 to 1,400 basis function SCF is you know, not more than an hour or so on one node. So again, the basic idea that you can now quite routinely do geometry optimizations, potential energy surfaces here is really effectively realized. And while these are not small molecules, um, take a look at the MP2 times on the right-hand side and look how cheap they are compared to the SCF times. So Matt Goldie has done a very nice job of making sure that our MP2 code parallelizes nicely. And for systems that are in this size regime, and this is, I believe, with a CCPVDZ basis, so it's a medium size, so they're not large basis, um, the MP2 cost is actually substantially less than the SCF cost. If we scale that up from a CCPVDZ basis to the CCPVTZ basis, the SCF time actually rises faster um, than the MP2 time. One is scaling essentially quartically with the number of functions per atom, and that's the SCF. The RIMP2 rises no worse than cubically. Um, so, uh, so for calculations on the 1 to 2,000 basis function scale, um, the parallel capability and the good scaling of QCAM's algorithms really uh, makes these um, SCF and simple MP2 calculations very viable. All right, so I apologize. This is uh, less than perfectly readable due to our minor technical glitches, but if you can avoid looking at the double-click to edit bit and read the bit in yellow, um, we're now switching from MP2 theory to coupled cluster theory, and these are some OpenMP parallel timings on the MUH2O system, which I guess is the um, is uh, is a methylated uh, uracil, and uh, uh, and it's interacting with water, which you can see down here. So I see, I guess, two methyl groups um, um, substituted into uracil. So this is not a tiny calculation at all for couple cluster theory, and so we're looking at times per couple cluster iteration here. These are times in seconds, and we've switched back from AMD to Intel Xeon nodes. We're back to a 12-core Xeon node. And the important point is that QCAM's couple cluster code um, is very competitive with a um, you know, with Malpro, which is typically recognized as the state-of-the-art couple cluster code for the spin-restricted calculation shown up the top. And you can see nice scalings um, from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, and um, beginning to tail off a bit as we go from 8 to 12 CPUs, but essentially parallel speedups that are comparable or better than Malpro. And then, um, and then take a look at the open shell calculation down the bottom where, um, where QCAM is nearly a factor of two faster than Malpro. So, um, so the, the, um, the key conclusions here are that our coupled cluster capabilities um, in version 4.1 have open MP parallel capabilities that, um, that are on the, the same level of uh, performance as, um, as SCF and MP2. And relative to rival codes that are state of the art, they are comparable in performance to Malpro for closed shell, and uh, and we're seeing a, a factor of nearly two speed up for open shell systems. And um, while I don't have time to talk about it here, and in fact I'm not really 
the best person to talk about it. Um, this is running conventional CCSD, and if you introduce um, RI or Cholesky to uh, replace, to approximate the full center of two electron integrals, um, then there's an additional speed up as well. <clears throat> so, um, um, so that's more or less the end of, um, of uh, the first sort of in-depth look, which is really what does the open MP parallel capabilities mean for production quantum chemistry, and taking the paradigm that, you know, one job should grab one node, um, version 4.1 can really do this quite effectively. Okay, so let's switch to um, a second capability, and this is some um, new developments in the freezing string method, FSM for short, for reaction path finding. If you want a more detailed look at the FSM, you can go back and view webinar number one, where I talked about this in some detail. Here I'm just going to brush through it relatively briefly. Um, the, th the basic point is that, um, is that in practical applications of electronic structure methods to unravel reaction mechanisms, um, one of the most human labor intensive parts is trying to find the transition structures. And the traditional way that people have done it is to essentially guess the transition structure by hand and then, um, and then refine it using a good local optimization method. And all quantum chemistry codes contain good local optimization methods. The catch is that those methods will fail if the guess is not good enough. In other words, if the Hessian, the second derivative matrix, doesn't have the right structure. Because remember, what you're trying to do when you find a transition state is walk downhill in all directions but one, which is the reaction coordinate. And in that direction, you've actually got to try and walk uphill. So that's a very difficult optimization problem. And it only works if the Hessian um, at your initial guess structure has, has the right form. So, um, so often what results in the traditional paradigm is that you, you guess your transition structure job fails, um, i.e. you find a transition state for spinning a methyl group instead of maybe making and breaking a carbon-carbon bond. You guess a new one, you repeat until finally you get the one you want. And so, it's, and so while that is efficient in the sense of minimum use of the computer for local optimization, it's inefficient in human time. And so the idea of the freezing string method is to have a relatively inexpensive automated method that can locate the true transition structure in one job. Um, start and the input to this job is essentially the geometry optimized of the reactant and the product. So if you know the two points, the two minima that your saddle point is connecting, then it's, um, then it's possible to automate this process. And, um, and the simplest guess about how you might automate is to say, why don't I just interpolate linearly between the known reactant and the known product? And so this is kind of illustrated on the left here where we've got a reactant basin over here, product basin there, and linear interpolation will, will be a, a valid path that joins them, but it won't be anything like a good guess at the transition structure. The transition structure in this case is in the, in the vicinity of this little red circle. And you can see that by contrast with that, the direct interpolation goes through very high energy intermediates. And so that means you get bad guesses at the transition structure. So the idea of the freezing string method is essentially a quite sophisticated yet still computationally inexpensive refinement of the interpolation idea. Basic point is you begin from the reactant and the product, and you start with a linear interpolation and take a little step to define a first node away from the, from the product and a first node away from the reactant. And then you inspect the perpendicular forces, the forces perpendicular to the reaction coordinate, and you relax with some constraints on the extent to which you can relax, you relax those perpendicular forces to arrive at the, at the final frozen position of the node, which is this um, perpendicular structure shown here for the first node. Then you do a new linear interpolation again, and that gives you two new trial nodes, and you relax those perpendicular, and you can see graphically here that you're heading towards a much better guess at the transition structure. The thing that's exciting about the freezing string method is that its cost is not much greater than a local search 
for a transition structure given a guess. It takes typically on the order of 100 gradients to get an FSM path joining a reactant and a product. And, um, and then one takes the highest energy point on that reaction path as the initial guess for a transition structure. And so for one of, for an application that was done in my group, this is some um, essentially the formation of the two prime butoxide species in MFI zeolite. Um, and so there's a cartoon on the right here of, um, um, of essentially we, we were basically beginning with, uh, with butene here and making butoxide. And uh, on, on the left is the 20 node FSM picture of the reaction coordinate going from the physisorb species at the left to the butoxide species that's then chemisorbed at the right. And the guess at the transition structure corresponds to this highest node here in the middle. 135 gradients required for that. And then you launch the, um, and then you launch the, uh, um, the, the transition state search from that very good guess. Um, let's see, so um, input, well, there's two structures, right? So there's a reactant and a product, and the job is at FSM. This is a little glimpse at QChem's sophisticated text input. Um, um, but, um, but nonetheless, it just gives you the general idea. There are actually two sets of molecules in that input. So, um, so this is then kind of a, a quick in-depth look at a second feature, which is an automatic method for finding transition structures that saves human time at moderate cost of computer time on the order of 100 extra gradients. And my group and other groups have already used this in successfully in dozens of quite complicated applications. In fact, one recent one that a student in my group completed is the isomerization, an isomerization involved in biofuel refining in zeolites, taking um, a glucose-like species that comes from the breakdown of biomass to a fructose-like species, which is then on the way to fuel molecules. And the reaction, um, the reaction mechanism for that isomerization involves roughly 12 to 15 steps with transition structures in between each intermediate and the FSM was absolutely vital in making that kind of study feasible. In the context of QCHEM 4.1, um, one thing to highlight is the fact that the FSM now um, has the new ability to launch the transition state search without the need for an exact Hessian. <clears throat> and what that means is that, um, is that the FSM code has been updated to build an approximate Hessian that has the correct structure, um, knowing the initial guess at the end of the FSM calculation. So it will select one mode that has negative curvature, that's the reaction coordinate, and it will then merge that concave down mode with all of the concave up modes corresponding to all other normal coordinates. And then just a a few notes about how your mileage will vary. You don't actually get a true intrinsic reaction coordinate here. Um, okay, so um, um, so perhaps let's um, let's now go on to um, um, an update on our energy decomposition analysis capabilities. This is um, work done in my group, so I'm relatively well qualified to talk about it. Uh, the student in question is Paul Horn, who's um, done a fantastic job of upgrading our um, ALMO EDA, which is a unique tool for breaking down the kind of intermolecular interactions that control host guest binding and metal ligand binding or hydrogen bonding into the physical constituents that you can then compare and contrast. And uh, we'll talk a, a bit about what those constituents are. And, um, and if you want more detail, you can read about it in these three papers here including the new work that was just published earlier this year in the Journal of Chemical Physics. So what is this ALMO EDA and what's the basic idea? The idea is to essentially take your favorite kind of density functional, and we know everyone's got their favorite, um, and instead of just doing one calculation on an intermolecular interaction and separate calculations on the fragments and computing the binding energy, you do a bunch of intermediate calculations that correspond to the progressive release of variational constraints. So in other words, you've been doing variational calculations successively releasing constraints. And um, the first kind of calculation you do is something where the orbitals of your interacting molecules are frozen at the isolated molecule um, description. And 
allowed to interact with respect to the Pauli principle. And that gives a treatment of the Pullman electrostatics, things like dipole-dipole interactions, and, um, and Pauli repulsions, that's the overlap of occupied levels, and, um, and the dispersion interaction between the molecules if that's present in the functional. Then from there, we, we allow the orbitals to relax, but with the constraint of no charge transfer between them, so no donor-acceptor interactions. And, um, and that corresponds physically to allowing the presence of polarization or electrostatic induction. And so, um, and so that second variational energy is guaranteed to be lower than the first because it, we've released a variational constraint. We've relaxed the monomer orbitals in the presence of their fellow monomers. Um, then finally, we relax the constraint that no electrons can transfer, and that allows a description of forward and back donation. And, um, and so that's the, that's the basic scheme. Um, in, um, in a little more detail, that means that the energy is broken up into these four pieces, the three that I just described, with a little twist that the forward-back donation piece is done in a pairwise additive fashion, because you'd like to be able to see forward donation separate from back donation. But if you do that separation, there's, there has to be a little tiny higher order piece left over at the end that corresponds to polarization associated accompanying charge transfer, and that's not pairwise decomposable. And so anyway, so that's the basic scheme, and, um, and I'll just show you a few chemical examples to kind of maybe whet your appetite for the sort of, you know, sort of applications where this might be useful. So let's say that you want to activate a CH bond, and, uh, um, but maybe not go all the way to making hydrides. Um, then you'd like to understand in a alkane binding to a potential transition metal complex that can act as the CH activator, what are the contributions to the interaction? So this is some um, rhenium complex binding methane, and it, at the equilibrium geometry, it's showing you that the frozen orbital interaction is repulsive by some 66 kilojoules per mole. If you relax those orbitals, you still don't get any net binding. So this is a complex that is only bound through dative interactions. And the dative interactions are dominated by forward donation from the CH bond into empty metal orbitals of the rhenium, with about a one-third contribution from back donation from filled rhenium orbitals to, well, the CH sigma star orbital. And so the fact that back donation is not so strong here is why this is a complex which doesn't go all the way to making um, a metal hydride. Um, so, th so that's the kind of physical component of it. Um, well, I should show you some species that involve radicals because that's the new capability of QCHEM 4.1. So let's consider for a couple of minutes the interaction between the water molecule and the benzene cation. And um, you can imagine two kinds of complexes here. Um, the first complex is one where, um, um, where the uh, water molecule is interacting with benzene cation from above the benzene ring. And, um, and there's a little bar graph over here on the right-hand side showing you, um, uh, showing you the ingredients of the interaction. So in deep purple is the frozen interaction, in dark blue is the induction or polarization, and in green is the charge transfer. And so for this on-top interaction between, um, um, between the, wa the water molecule and benzene cation, we are in fact dominated by a charge transfer interaction. And what's going on is reasonably physically evident, which is that the lone pair of water is donating into the half-filled pi orbital of the benzene cation in the alpha space. Um, in, I'm sorry, in the beta space where there's a hole. And so you see that, the, um, that that forward donation in the beta space dominates by a factor of five or six. The much weaker forward donation, which is into a pi star orbital in the alpha space. So, um, so that's the nature of the charge transfer interaction. It's primarily um, helping to fill the hole in benzene um, by uh, donating into the, um, the beta lumo, which in fact is really a, a pi bonding orbital. By contrast, if you um, interact benzene cation with water um, side on, or if you like, end on, um, the interaction changes character completely and, um, and now is dominated by the frozen interaction with small con 
small contributions from induction and a very small contribution from charge transfer. And that's because now the, um, the pi hole is essentially inaccessible from a water molecule coming from the side. And so the best that, that the system can do in order to lower its energy is to, um, is to, is to interact the, um, the water dipole moment with the net positive charge of the benzene ring and not, um, and not overlap the electron densities so strongly as to have much poorly repulsion. So this just shows you how nicely this energy decomposition scheme can pick out the changing character of an intermolecular interaction as you simply move the pair of interacting molecules around, um, taking it from side on to, um, to on top. Um, well, some people don't like in, um, energy decomposition analysis because they say it doesn't connect to observables, but this isn't really true. You can actually always connect energy decomposition analysis if it's done variationally to experimental observables. So I just want to show you this. Um, this is work done by Daniel Lembrecht and Eloy ramos Padobo. Daniel was a postdoc in my group and is now a faculty member at Pitt. And, um, and we were looking at the effect of charge transfer on structure, um, dipole moment and vibrations of the water diamond. And, um, and just to give you a little bit of an idea here, the full hydrogen bond is 19 kilojoules per mole. If you prohibit charge transfer, you get about 14 of that. So something like, something like five or six kilojoules per mole is charge transfer. What kind of effect does that charge transfer have on observables? Well, you can firstly optimize the geometry including charge transfer on the right, you get the classical hydrogen bond length of 1.95. If you remove it, prohibit it by not releasing that last set of constraints, then that hydrogen bond distance stretches by about um, 0.2 angstroms. And so that's a, an observable manifestation of charge transfer in hydrogen bonding, which is it's responsible for the last two tenths of an angstrom of the hydrogen bond length. It's even more spectacular if you look at the vibrational frequencies, and this is partly to show off the energy decomposition analysis and partly also to show off QCAM's quasi-classical trajectory code, which, by the way, was developed by Daniel as well. Um, the important thing is the mode omega-9, which, um, which is an OH stretch corresponding to the OH that is the proton donor in the hydrogen bond. And what you see is that comparing omega-9 and omega-10, there is a very small splitting in the ALMO vibrational frequency calculation at the harmonic level shown up top. And that's because charge transfer is prohibited there. But once you allow charge transfer, and remember what is the charge transfer, it's going from the oxygen lone pair into the OH sigma star orbital, you then see a pronounced splitting between omega-9 and omega-10 about 100 wave numbers, 120 wave number splitting, and a big change in the intensities, which are given in parentheses. So the moral of the story here is that while only a minority piece of the hydrogen bond strength is due to charge transfer, it has a very important majority contribution to the red shift in the OH stretch and to the intensity enhancement associated with that OH stretch as well. And uh, the picture down the bottom is the same thing, but lifting the harmonic approximation and doing instead quasi-classical trajectory. So you then see the ALMO um, spectrum in blue and the, um, and the full one in red. And you see the, um, the pronounced red shift of that OH stretch and the intensity enhancement very, very clearly. So that's the second example. And the third example, one that we just published very recently, about two months ago, in Journal of the American Chemical Society, is some is using energy decomposition analysis to understand um, a um, a, uh, a photofragmentation process associated with uh, um, photo photoionizing the glycerol molecule shown at the left, and um, and Francisca Bell and my group um, performed extensive calculations that resolved the mystery of what were what was the origin of the appearance threshold seen in the um, in the mass spectrum and it turned out the origin was that the ionized glycerol molecule rearranged 
immediately to form a ternary complex. So that's a complex consisting of the vinyl alcohol cation, a water molecule, and formaldehyde, which if you keep track of your atoms is exactly the same as glycerol cation itself. And it's that complex which later on goes on to fragment because it's got plenty of kinetic energy. Um, so energy decomposition analysis is a nice way to then take a look at that ternary complex or a triplex, if you like, and um, and let's take a quick glance at the three intermolecular interactions that go into the triplex because they're actually quite interesting, and it's another nice illustration of how energy decomposition analysis can unravel the different contributions. So the strongest interaction at 27 kcals per mole, I apologize, I've switched units, so 100 kJ per mole roughly, is the hydrogen bond between vinyl alcohol cation and the water molecule. And so this is a hydrogen bond on steroids because of the presence of the charge. And, um, and of course, you could say, well, this is a hydrogen bridged iron molecule complex. That's the traditional view from the mass spec community. And in that view, you'd expect this hydrogen bond to be absolutely electrostatically dominated. But the interesting result, and one of the reasons that this became a Jack's paper is that in fact, that's not fully true. There's a big charge transfer contribution that, um, that we see very clearly from the energy decomposition analysis of this radical complex. The second strongest interaction, about half the strength, 12 kcals per mole, is between vinyl alcohol cation and the formaldehyde molecule, which does not carry much of a charge. And this could be a hydrogen bond, but not a good one. It's very long. And so this one really is electrostatically dominated. That is an iron molecule interaction. But look how nicely the EDA has picked out the contrast between the electrostatically dominated interaction and something that really, at least in my view, should be regarded as a very strong hydrogen bond, not, a, uh, uh, not simply an iron molecule interaction. OK, so, um, so I'm running out of time here, but I will walk you through one more example, and that is um, that is a little bit about attenuated MP2. And this is work done also by Matt Goldie, who you heard about in the context of parallel MP2 before. Um, all right, so um, MP2, while it's a good cheap method, is not a great cheap method because for some intermolecular interactions, MP2 greatly overbinds them. A, a good example is the benzene dimer, where the um, where the uh, sandwich configuration is overbound by um, at least 50% at MP2. And if you go to bigger stack, bigger stacking interactions, and I'll show you the coronene dimer in a little bit, the overestimation goes to more than a factor of two, nearly, uh, nearly two and a half. So, um, so Matt and I set out to try and improve MP2 theory by, um, by not calculating the long range part, which is expensive anyway and not terribly accurate. And we originally thought we would, um, we would thereby get definitely greater accuracy because we could put back a long range kind of damp C6 type correction, a little like the dash Ds that you're familiar, may be familiar with from DFT. And we might also in the future be able to get higher efficiency because we're not calculating the long range part to begin with. And um, and this is a plot that goes better with the graphic, with the animations that we would have hopefully been able to see, but maybe I, I can walk you through it. So on the x-axis is the attenuation parameter. So we're electronically attenuating the two electron integrals, introducing effectively a cutoff, R0. And we're looking at R0 in angstrom. So as R0 goes to infinity, we'll recover the MP2 value. As R0 goes to zero, we have no two electron integrals for correlation, so we recover Hartree-Fock theory. And then the interesting thing is that as you look at, for instance, the results for, this is the root mean square error in kilocalories per mole for the S66 data set. So that's a collection of 66 intermolecular interactions. The RMS error in org CCPVDZ starts off at 2.5 kcals per mole. Um, at, at, um, at long distance. And as you come in attenuating, the RMS error begins to fall rapidly. And the exciting discovery is that we can reduce the RMS error by a factor of about six by using an attenuation length of about one angstrom. 
how can this possibly work so well? Um, well, the answer is essentially that we are taking two errors of finite basis MP2 theory, overestimation of intermolecular interactions in the complete basis set limit, and even more overestimation due to basis set superposition error in not a very good basis. Those two errors have the same sign. And so we're adding a third error, namely attenuating the integrals, that has the opposite sign. And what you see from this six-fold reduction in error is that we were able to cancel those errors very effectively. And you may say, well, was this just good luck in the lousy augmented CCPVDZ basis? So we then examined the slightly less lousy augmented CCPVTZ basis. And the results are roughly the same. There's a different basis set specific attenuation parameter. It's got a bit longer because you want to keep a bit more of the short range interaction in this better basis. But there's still a six fold reduction in error. So that's cool. And in order to get that six fold reduction, essentially what's going on is that the different kinds of intermolecular interactions in the S66 data set, the hydrogen bonds, the dispersion complexes, the mix that is containing electrostatics, hydrogen bonding, and dispersion, they all essentially show the same behavior with respect to attenuation. They all have a nice sharp minimum around 1.35, and, uh, and that's why this thing can work. We've done all kinds of transferability tests, and I'll just show you one. And I mentioned the bigger pi stacking systems before, so this is the coronene dimer. And so coronene is take a benzene ring and and circumscribe it with additional benzene rings and then make the pi stack. That is some um, that is that pi stack is bound by about 20 kcals per mole, and um, and MP2 in the or DZ basis predicts about 60, so that's a three factor of three error. In or TZ predicts 45, and if you look at the attenuated MP2 results, they are really encouragingly close to the benchmark value. Um, so that's uh, an illustration of attenuated MP2, which is included in QCAM 4.1 for the first time. And it's a, a nice cheap tool for um, reducing the errors of finite basis MP2. And in that sense, it's a competitor for dispersion corrected DFT. All right, so I'm now going to wrap up over the next couple of minutes. And I just want to, I guess, comment again that because QCAM is really a um, um, a development-driven company. We have a lot of things that are exciting things that are coming in the future. The next release beyond 4.1 will be version 4.2 that will come out um, roughly, let's see, roughly in April or May of next year, right? Um, May of next year. And, um, um, and it will have a bunch of exciting new things. Probably the most exciting things are contributions from Christian Oxenfeld's group in Munich. Um, his group has contributed spin-spin coupling code, so QCAM has long had very good chemical shift capabilities, NMR chemical shift capabilities, but coming in version 4.2 will be the addition of spin-spin couplings, so the ability to do a complete description of an NMR spectrum at the density function of theory level. Um, so that's very exciting. And another exciting thing from Christian's group is low scaling um, RI based MP2 methods. So I showed you before calculations that were in the vicinity of 1 to 2,000 basis functions. But if you double from, say, 1,400 to 3,000 basis functions, the fifth order scaling of MP2 begins to really kick in. And Christian's group has developed exciting um, low scaling MP2 methods that will be part of version 4.2. Um, my group also has some neat things in version 4.2, but because our animations are not working, they will have to stay top secret for right now. And uh, what I can tell you is that I and a very talented student, Aved Mardarassian, are working on new density functionals. These are removing the, um, the um, damped C6 um, piece of my group's functional omega B97X-D and replacing it with a true van der Waals functional in omega B97X-V and also reducing the number of empirical parameters by about one third. And um, well, the results unfortunately are top secret, but uh, uh, but wait, wait a second, maybe I can actually do some live editing here. Um, okay, so, um, so in fact, um, what I want to show you very briefly then is um, 
um, is that relative to omega b97 x dash d, which is lurking under here somewhere, there we go, we are able to get roughly a twofold reduction in a test set of 1,000 non bonded interactions um, without degrading the thermochemistry, reducing the semi empiricism substantially, and getting rid of the atom atom potential. So that's another exciting thing coming. All right, well, let's say we're at the end here and you want to learn more, and maybe you don't think of your questions straight away to ask me, so um, please visit our website. So it's qchem.com, and there's actually, oh, uh, there's another 11 um, webinars that you can uh, go look at um, on YouTube, and, um, and this might sound slightly insane, but you can also download the manual and actually see what QCAM can do, even if you don't have QCAM, and so that's available to, uh, at the website, or you can browse it online. And um, since my lucky number came up and I co-edited the manual, the 4.1 manual and a Krilov, I guess I have to take responsibility for any typos that you might find. Um, let's see, how to reach us? Well, um, office information, sales information, license information, and maybe most important support information is shown here, and of course it's all on the website as well. And it remains for me to thank the QCHEM team. Genya was the host, um, Evgeny that is, um, and, uh, and the rest of the QCHEM employees, the QCHEM board, my research group whose results I was telling, talking about in part, the QCHEM development community, and finally you guys for listening. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, now we have a few minutes um, for a couple of questions. And please use the uh, questions tab to, to ask your questions, and then we'll take them and I'll uh, announce them um, for everybody. So the first question is, uh, Martin, could you touch on some of the QMMM capabilities in QCAM? Um, I can touch on them, but I'm, I'm, not, the, I'm, I'm not the most expert person. Um, so my own group does QMMM quite extensively to treat catalysis in zeolites, and that is um, electrostatic embedding using the link atom type approach. And so, um, and so we've um, basically studied roughly um, ten or twelve significant challenges in catalysis successfully that way. Um, so electrostatic embedding is a standard feature of QCHEM. Um, then, um, um, then we also have John Herbert's group that has contributed the um, um, the, uh, X, the recently developed XPOL and XSAPT approaches, um, and then we have the effective fragment approaches, and I bet we even have a few more that I that I'm not thinking of right now. So we we have quite a range of QMMM capabilities, and there will be more enhancements coming in that direction in the future. Um, one particular question about the presentation. In the water uh, benzene plus dimer, what is the amount of charge that gets transferred? Um, one interesting feature of the energy decomposition analysis is that it does give the number of electrons that are transferred um, in a way that is fundamentally different from population analysis. So in population analysis, you basically take you know, the population of, of, of electrons and divide it between atoms. It's a little like taking the people that live in Oakland and the people that live in San Jose and trying to draw a cut to distinguish. But that's really not appropriate for forward and back donation. So what we do in the EDA for movement of electrons is we actually decompose the change in the density matrix the same way we decompose the change in the Hamiltonian. And, um, and so we actually have a number for that, for the benzene-water interaction, and my guess is that it's on the order of, um, of no more than one-tenth of an electron, probably less, um, but I don't actually have the precise number. Next question is about the um, attenuated MP2 methods. Is the uh, attenuation distance adjustable for different DFT methods, or is it fixed? Um, what we have done so, f what we have published so far, and maybe I can just pop the screen back to the to the um, to the right point, um, is um, um, is essentially 
stuff that is specific to NP2 theory. Um, so, um, so essentially, for a given basis set in this first paper, we have the optimal attenuation parameter for MP2 in the augmented CCPV DZ basis. In the second paper, we then did the extension to augmented CCPV TZ. And in this third paper that is currently in press, we did a whole bunch of transfer additional transferability tests. So one could think about taking this attenuation idea and importing it into double hybrid density functional theory. And that's a topic that is um, under discussion in my group right now, but I don't have anything to report at this point. All right. Uh, thank you, Martin, for answering the questions. And thank, uh, I'd like to thank the audience for asking the questions. Um, I think it's time to wrap up now. Um, uh, after uh, Completing after the completion of this webinar, um, you'll receive an email asking for um, asking to complete a survey. Uh, we would like to hear from you. And again, um, we uh, extend our apologies for the uh, diminished quality of the organization work, but um, that in no way diminished the quality of the presentation. Uh, so uh, my name is Evgeny Vifanovsky, and I thank you for attending this webinar. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Professor Martin and Gordon for his excellent presentation. If you've not tried Kick and Link, we have come a long way, and we invite you to utilize our two-month full-feature demo, which you can request by hitting the orange free demo button on our website. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact us by emailing either Shintin or Yihan at the email addresses noted on your screen. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation and see you at the next webinar.